welcome to the uh, uh, highly uh, decorated group we have, the elite uh, attendees and, and Julio. So thank you for coming for today for our first uh, uh, rounds for the uh, calendar year 2022. Um, just a couple of housekeeping things first, and we'll talk about them afterwards. But the uh, please, everybody, when you're done, uh, you'll get a um, uh, a uh, an evaluation form, please complete them. Uh, we haven't received many recently and it's really helpful to us in terms of planning future talks and things like um, like that. Also, the talk is being recorded and we will put it up on our uh, YouTube page as well as our uh, uh, UWO page. Um, so just though, although I would prefer if people use the uh, raise hand function to ask questions, just be aware that if you do that, your voice will be recorded and uh, so will be available to others to hear, although you may or may not be identified um, uh, with that. Okay, so uh, that having been said, let us get started. So our guest today is uh, Dr. Uh, Julio Martinez. And I was um, scrounging uh, the web, trying to find a picture of, um, of Dr. Martinez uh, and... Uh, Where did it uh, go? Uh, oh, I think here we are here. So this is uh, uh, Julio Martinez, who is the world uh, uh, flyweight boxing champion who was built very much like Julio, I believe. Uh, and so Dr. Martinez uh, is a professor in the Department of Physiology and Pharmacology and in Psychiatry at the Schulich School of Medicine and Dentistry in London. Uh, he is a scientist in the Robarts Research Institute of Western and the Provincial Endowed Academic Chair in um, autism. He is a member of the international research network Neuronex, uh, which contributes to research on mental representation and working memory, and a core member of the Brain and Mind Institute at Western. So Julio uh, did his medical degree at um, the University of, of Havana, which surprisingly enough is in Havana, uh, and did his uh, residency, residency in clinical neurophysiology there as well, before leaving uh, to do his master's degree and his PhD at the University of, of Tübingen in Germany. Did you ever cross paths with Suzanne when you were at uh, Tübingen? No, no. Um, uh, he then uh, moved to Canada, thankfully, to uh, do his postdoctoral training at York uh, before moving to uh, McGill, uh, where he was a uh, Canada Research Chair in um, uh, in what, Julio? I, my mind has gone blank. In uh, oh. visual um, physiology, I think, was it not? Neuroph neuroscience, yeah. Yep. Uh, and then thankfully he was recruited to come to London uh, to uh, work on autism and other neurodevelopmental um, disorders. And Julio is, uh, first of all, an incredibly nice human being. I, I, a couple of years ago, Julio and I had an issue with an appointment, a cross appointment in the department, and it got messed up. And I actually had to ask Julio to pretend to get angry because I'm not certain if he's actually able to, uh, to show anger because he always seems to be in a very good mood. Um, but I think that uh, belies sort of uh, his incredible productivity. So Julio has uh, at least 62 publications, including numerous ones in journals like Nature and Nature Neuroscience. Uh, and as you might've heard us talk about right now, currently he holds over $5 million in research uh, funding uh, from uh, CIA, uh, CIHR and other organizations. So today, and we will stop showing everybody that picture of you, Julio. Um, we, uh, Julio's talk today will be on uh, stem cell derived models to understand the pathogenesis of uh, retinum. So Julio, let me um, give you the ability to uh, share your screen and you are good to go. All right, let me share a screen. Um, do you see there my presentation? Yep. All right, let me see if I uh, hit here and I should be, do you see there? Yep. Okay. Well, first of all, thanks, Rob, for the introduction. And I'm going to have a hard time getting out of my head this, that picture because I probably will, when I get home, I will start putting the same thing in front of the mirror just to prove myself that I am any close to that perfection of the human body that I am not. But I think, uh, I think, well, that's, the I think that's the assumption we all have, Julio. <laughs> but I'll try my best. So uh, the other thing I have to say is that it has been a pleasure to be here and to work with Rob and, and, and incredible people here at Schulich um, um, at Western. So um, I want to say that this is a kind of a new uh, direction that our research has been taking over the last years. 
and um, and that has been driven by uh, by a collaboration with the uh, hospital for sick kids. And I'm going to try to be as explicit as possible uh, on this. So uh, uh, ask me questions if there is any question about this. So I'm just going to talk about using stem cell derived models to understand the pathogenesis of Red syndrome. Um, the objectives are understanding the concept of human induced uh, pluripotent cells or induced pluripotent cells. It could be in any species too, and the applications to a study of developmental disabilities. Uh, explain how MECP2 mutations, which is a gene related to Red syndrome, has been identified. The mutation related to Red syndrome can produce changes in early stages of neuronal development and neuronal network development, um, and, and drive the symptomatology of the Red syndrome. Uh, third, describe how mutation severity uh, uh, can imp impact changes in early neural network development in patients with Red syndrome. And finally, understand how these uh, I, a human uh, induced pluripotent stem cells models can serve to identify therapeutic targets in patients with Red syndrome. All right. First of all, I'm just going to give you a prime that many of you know about embryonic development in mammals. As many of you know, after fertilization um, uh, of an egg and a sperm, um, uh, and you have the cell, the, 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 the first cells actually forming in the uh, in uterus, you have a proliferation of these cells that goes into the blastomers, and, and then there is different stages of proliferation. And something that I want to notice here that all these cells here on the left side hand side of this circle, they look similar. They have they have the same color and probably they, they, they look uh, kind of similar to cells. Now, uh, and day four, you start seeing a differentiation uh, in cells, for example, in the inner cell mass and the trophoblast. The trophoblast is gonna form the placenta and then the inner cell mass is where the embryo is gonna form from this inner cell mass. But the first thing that I want to tell you about is that neural differentiation is start at about this stage. For some reason from one cell, now you can have more than one cell types, and that happens through development in mammals. Now the development keeps going on and on, and I don't pretend that I'm gonna give you a, a lecture in embryology because I'm also not a specialist, but at this second stage where you see this inner cell mass, so the outer cell mass, the trophoblast is gonna give uh, um, origin to the placenta, but the inner cell mass is gonna give um, origin to the embryo. And in the embryo, you have different actually cell layers, that they form uh, uh, the different the ectodermers, ectoderm, ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm, which are the three different embryonic layers. Again, the point here is that you have another cap the capacity of these cells in this inner mass to uh, uh, evolve into different cell lineages, into different cell types. From the same DNA, basically, we can actually uh, go into different programs that they give different cell types in, in the human. And therefore, that's why we have eyes and we have brains and we have muscles and we have these different cell types. So uh, one of the things I wanted to, uh, to notice too was that um, from these three different types, the endoderm, ectoderm, and mesoderm, you have different organs. And a particular interest for this lecture is the ectoderm that is uh, basically is an epithelium. And these epitheliums, uh, what is called the neural plate, uh, uh, suffer some kind of folding here. And from the folding, you have the neural tube and the brain, the spinal cord, and all these uh, uh, structures come from this neural tube. So somehow there is uh, uh, the ability for this epithelium, uh, the ectoderm, to differentiate into uh, uh, the brain and something as different as the brain as the skin. So something happened at the cellular level that the genetic programs, they, they allow the cells to branch out into different lineages with the same set of DNA. Just something that I would like just to remember is that DNA in these cells don't change. Even if they look very different, they have the, the, the same set of genes. Now, um, you can define as embryonic pluripotent cells are cells that have the capacity to self-renew by dividing and to develop into the three primary germ layers of the early embryo, and therefore into cells of the adult body except for example, for non extracellular tissues such as the placenta. So the, the, the embryonic pluripotent stem cells don't uh, include those, um, uh, that capacity. So they can develop into these different um, human body tissues. 
Now, how do you define pluripotency in embryonic stem cells? Well, it's basically what we were saying, that they can actually divide into heart cells, into brain cells, into immune system cells. Um, but what about if these unipotent cells that are already differentiated, they preserve the genetic code, the DNA structure, so which is basically the manual to make genes and to make proteins, uh, I'm sorry, not to make genes, the manual to make proteins, uh, and, and the different components of the cells. So, and also for genetic programs and for many other things, the genes are not encoding proteins all, or only, there are different uh, functions to these different genes. Um, the question is, could you actually induce or reverse these cells that are already differentiated into a state of pluripotency? So basically, can you reverse these arrows back into something that looks like these pluripotent cells that could differentiate into different things. That would be great if you can do that. Um, and basically that was the discovery uh, in 2006 by Takahashi and Yamanaka uh, that they opened a completely new venue of stem cell research by showing that you can actually, by forcing the, uh, the expression of only four transcription factors, OT4, SOX5, KLF4, and CMYK, uh, was sufficient to convert fibroblast cells taken from the skin into embryonic stem cells. So they couldn't call that embryonic stem cells. And it's a little bit complicated because uh, um, um, these are not fully identical, but they do have pluripotency. So in this case, they call them induced pluripotent stem cells. So the idea is that you can take it, for example, in the mouse, which is the first uh, species that they describe that, they can take a fibroblast and they, uh, through the in, in induction with these uh, four transcription factors, they can make it a pluripotent cell. And once you have a pluripotent cell, if you have the formula or the recipe, you can differentiate these pluripotent cells into any of the fates that you want, either muscle, brain, or different things. In fact, just one year after they did it in mouse, they did it in humans. And that kind of changed uh, uh, the, the um, uh, the rules of the game. Now you can have human cells from fibroblast that you can induce into pluripotency. So I would recommend to, to listen to the uh, Nobel Prize talk by uh, Shinja Yamanaka. It's actually amazing the, the, uh, to listen to him. And he's also very funny. He's a witty, uh, funny guy. Um, now these human induced pluripotent cells, again, you can take a biopsy from the skin of a patient or, or a human, and you can reprogram those cells, and then you can induce uh, um, these pluripotent stem cells and differentiate it into different fates, including the nervous system. Now, one of the things I would like to convey in this uh, presentation is that the uh, human induced pluripotent cells derived models are actively developing and express dynamic genetic programs that regulate the process of cell proliferation. So uh, differentiation into neural precursors and subsequently into mature neurons and glial cells. So you can take those cells and you can make neurons and you can make neurons at wire and you can make even three dimensional structures. And you can study the early stages of neural differentiation in, um, uh, in that system. And you can study also how that impact, for example, the development of synapses, the development of circuits uh, and different things. So you may also be able to rescue uh, those if you have tools, genetic tools to do that. And this is an example from Lancaster uh, uh, and co-workers. It was in the lab of uh, Johan Noblich in, in Austria. And in, in 2013, they published this paper in which they take pluripotent stem cells and they do a few manipulations like embedded into a matrix. Uh, it's called matrigel, it's some sort of gel. But when you do that and put, you put those cells and spinning in a bioreactor, you get something called brain organoids. Brain organoids are structures that actually resemble the structure of the brain. That's what they're called organoids. And you can look at the structure of the cortex. And what I'm showing here is just, uh, they're not just pretty pictures. They're actually stainings for different uh, expression of different genes that you can find in the forebrain, for example. In this case, the FOXG1 is a gene that you find in forebrain structures. Uh, in the choroid plexus, the TTR, so that's the cells that produce a respinal fluid. Um, you can find it in the hippocampus, a structure uh, um, involved in memory formation. So these prox X1 and FZ uh, uh, D9 genes, you can find it. 
and so on uh, in different structures. You can make motor neurons, you can make organoids that express more interneurons than, than excitatory cells. So that has changed actually the rules of the game. And I think that these model systems are uh, changing the way that we, do, that we do developmental neuroscience for humans. Now, why is that important to have these models? Many of you have said, well, why don't you actually apply uh, or use animal models to do this? Well, the human neocortex is a little bit more complicated than the neocortex of many mammals. Uh, and for example, in the case of, of rodents, I can show you an example here from this review from Louis et al. in Cell, that uh, this is the, the, the developing uh, rodent neocortex. And you can find, for example, something that we call it the ventricular zone. There is a cavity here full with liquid. And here you have these cells, the radial glia cell in the ventricular zone. And then you have the subventricular zone. This is, looks like, like how the lamina of the plate is developing. And then you have the intermediate zone with these progenitors called outer right glial cells and the cortical place where the cortex and the mature neurons develop. The main thing here is that from everything starts from the bottom and those cells go proliferating until they form these mature neurons in, in this uh, top. Now, if you look at the humans, the humans have, for example, something that is called the outer subventricular zone that you don't find it in these developing rodents. And the outer subventricular zone is very, um, abundant in a type of cell that is called uh, um, outer um, uh, radial glial cell, which is this one in red here, that you find very little in, in rodents, for example. But in humans, they proliferate a lot and they produce so many cell divisions that the, the number of cells that you get, get for progenitor cell in humans is much more larger than what you get, for example, in rodents. So these peculiarities of the human neocortex, they do matter because that's the reason why the neocortex in human has more cells than in any other species and also is expanded. So, and for cortex specifically, it's involved in many of the developmental disorders. I mean, it started with microcephaly, for example. These are some of the very uh, easy targets for this type of research. So it matters because these programs are a little bit different in humans and, uh, and, and in other animal models. So um, let's, uh, but, talk a little bit about neurodevelopmental disorder and that I would expand in, in, in what I just said. Uh, neurodevelopmental disorders are a broad group of disorders in which uh, development of the central nervous system is altered so that the way sensory, motor, and cognitive information is acquired and processed in postnatal development is disturbed. So uh, neurodevelopmental disorders also affect how neural networks are modified by ongoing neural activity. Uh, so, and it could result in, in a wide spectrum of emotional, cognitive, and motor, motor deficits. For example, deficits in language, nonverbal communication, memory, learning, and motor dysfunction. And the things, the syndrome that we're going to be talking about today show a lot of these features. That's why we chose it as a departing point for starting with these type of models. Now, it is very difficult to, uh, uh, to study neurodevelopmental disorders in humans. And this is because the animal models, such as rodent also are extraordinarily useful to study mammalian brain development. They do not show the structural, functional, and com uh, uh, structural and functional complexity of the human nervous system, particularly the cerebral cortex for the reasons that I showed you before. This huge number of neurons with these expanding cortical layers so it happens in, in humans. Uh, other primates also have it too, like apes and, and over monkeys, but in humans, it's definitely much more expanded. So it's very difficult to, to study uh, uh, some of neurodevelopmental disorders in animal models. Now, the study of postmortem tissue in humans is, is an option because way on to get postmortem tissue for the patient, but it can give you a snapshot of, of something or the structural changes in the, in the brain. And it does really allow measuring or manipulating nervous system function. You cannot see how the brain develops in different stages. So um, uh, the genetic studies are also useful to isolate genetic variants. You can go and screen a large part of the population and find that these two genes and the other ones are mutated, or you can find more polymorphism. Uh, however, they do not allow us to assess the consequences of these variants during development. All what you can do is actually correlational studies. You correlate a, gene, uh, a genetic change with some symptomatology in the patient. Uh, you cannot actually do rescue interventions or anything like that uh, in that case. So 
Now, I have to say that the ideal experimental model for restoring human early development is the embryonic stem cell. But embryonic stem cells are in human embryos. And there are several ethical issues, as well as lack of accessibility to prevent the use of, of, of uh, uh, hu human embryonic stem cells to the point that years ago in, in our neighbor uh, um, country in the South, some of these stem cells were actually, uh, this research was banned uh, in a certain way, or at least certain aspects of it. So the human induced pro reporting stem cells, you know, those that we get from differentiated tissue, are an alternative model that can be widely used to study individual patients and assess physiopathology and even rescue interventions. And I'm gonna show a little bit of that now. So let's uh, talk about specifically about the RED syndrome. Uh, the RED syndrome is a postnatal neurodevelopmental disorder that affects females almost exclusively. Affect females because, um, let me just talk a little bit about the symptomatology first. It is characterized by normal early growth and development until one year of age, the patient seems to be uh, uh, developing kind of normally. Also, they may be, after six months, they may be some uh, slow down, but um, that's what the literature says. Until one year of age, uh, you can see a progress in the development. Then it slows down, and then the patient starts losing, for example, a, a function like a purposeful use of hands. The patient could have hand movement, a slow brain and head growth, and problem with walking, seizures, language, and intellectual disability. So red syndrome only affects um, uh, uh, females because it's uh, due to a mutation of the MECP2 gene in the X chromosome. So, and, and this gene, we're gonna talk a little bit about what the gene does, but most males, you don't see males with their syndrome very often because the mutation is usually lethal. This gene is very uh, uh, important in the development of the nervous system and it's expressed in, in high, in neurons and cells in the nervous system is, is, is strongly expressed. Now here is just to, to motivate this, the RED syndrome, um, this is, I took it from the QR RED uh, website and to explain a little bit of the symptomatology. For example, in Sky, this patient, uh, she actually lost swallow. So they have motor disorders with a um, um, problem with swallowing. In this case, Olive, uh, she lost uh, the ability to walk. And this is a very interesting case because they're twins. And you can see even uh, the, the, the size of the, of the muscles in the, in the twin and, the, and olive. Uh, Grace, uh, she has a language disorder. She can, she can talk. Uh, Holly, in this case, uh, they lose um, uh, vision. So uh, Eddie, Eddie uh, what she has is uh, she cannot express herself with language. So it's a language disorder too, so she screams. And Emily seems to have actually most problems with the sensory motor uh, uh, um, uh, perception, with sensory perception and things like that. And many of this you can also see in patients with autism and, and other developmental disabilities. But uh, this kind of summarizes a little bit of the variety of symptoms that Red syndrome has and how probably this deficit in this protein can uh, change uh, uh, a lot of things in the brain. Now, how, 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 how do we relate these genetic disorders to, uh, uh, to a brain, to brain structure and function? I'm just gonna give you a primer of how do we make a brain? This is a very uh, slow. So a, every neuron has a DNA and the DNA gets transcribed into RNA uh, or messenger RNA. And this RNA, J, RNA contains the codes that take it to the ribosomes and the, and the protein making machine in the cell to make proteins. And those proteins are the structures, enzymes, uh, phosphatases, all that kind of things that produces function ion channels for protein uh, for uh, activity of neurons in the brain. Indeed, so if you look at, for example, many of these proteins, they are located to the membrane and to any other functions, particularly in the brain and in excitable tissue. What these proteins do is allow the cells to transmit electrical signals, the action potentials, and these electrical signals, they actually, uh, uh, is a code that neurons use to communicate with each other. The reason why I'm talking to you and the reason why you are listening to this talk is because you have this type of uh, 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 structures in the nervous system that allows you to, uh, to have neural activity and convert it into thoughts, movements, perceptions, sensations. 
all that kind of thing. This is in, in general how a brain uh, is made. And this process here of transcription and translation is very important. And it all departs from the DNA, so the genetic code that is in, the, in each cell uh, in our uh, organism, not in, in, in red cells, though. They lose the nucleus, but uh, other cells they do have. Now, the MACP2 encodes a sequence for this specific protein, the methyl CPG binding protein 2, which is a trans like transcription of regulator. I just want to go to go back here. Transcription is the process of transferring the information from the DNA, which is locked into the nucleus, to the RNA that can travel and inform the genetic machinery of what it has to do, the synthetic, the protein synthesis machinery, what it has to do. So this uh, MACP2, again, is a transcription or regulator. And when you look at the change of DNA in the, in the, in the, uh, in the nucleus of the cell, there are different types of chromatin, the chromatin and therochromatin, uh, depends on the or how they look and how they cluster um, some pieces of DNA. And there is these proteins that is called histones that kind of wrap the DNA around, forming these uh, interesting structures, right? Now, the MECP2 binds to these proteins and the MECP2 can repress transcription. So say, don't make any more RNA, or could actually activate transcription, make more RNA, depending on, 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 on different processes that the uh, that MECP2 protein uh, undergoes and interaction with other constituents too. And uh, could compact the chromatin, could produce chromatin loop formation. And these processes, all of them, they can actually make less or more efficient the formation of the, trans the transcription of the RNA uh, from the DNA or, or DNA into RNA. Now, MACP2 regulates transcription and therefore protein expression in the brain. And as we know, proteins are needed for most of the vital functions that we have. It started with enzymatic functions uh, and, and any other regulatory activities, receptors. Uh, now, the MACP2 protein is abundantly expressed in the brain. So for some reason, and has been identified as abnormal in the red syndrome. There is many mutations of MACP2 that have been identified in the red syndrome. And actually you can go to some websites and identify all the mutations that have been listed. It's not only one, um, but uh, we can summarize the, the, the action of this uh, MACP2 for this talk as a epigenetic regulator that is modulated via activity dependent signal. This is a synapse. In the synapse, just a, a crash course on this, you have the presynaptic uh, terminal, the postsynaptic terminal, and where glutamate vesicles released from the presynaptic terminal, they activate these receptors and MDA and AMPA. And there, there is an electrical pulse fire for this postsynaptic terminal, and there is a signal going downstream in the neuron, and more signal in a more networks and more synaptic gets activated. And, and then that's how you implement neural activity. It's not chaotic, it's very highly organized in the brain. But uh, for the effects, what MECP2 does is uh, it's a transcription or regulator of the components of these synapses. For example, in this case, we have the CAM kinase 2 that could phosphorylate the protein, and the protein could activate brain derived neurotrophic factors, the downstream or the, or the translation, uh, transcription for this specific uh, protein, and it could actually start producing more components of the synapses when it is activated or less components of the synapses, depending on the, on the changes that happen. So uh, through MECP2, you can uh, regulate the activity of the synapses or the structure of the synapses, and the synapse function or activity can also regulate the activity of MECP2. So it's like a, a, a loop, a, a regulatory loop in, in between these different uh, things. Now, MACP2, we know that uh, the function is uh, impaired in the red syndrome. For example, in the normal neuron, you have here uh, a certain amount of MACP2. Suppose that this is the amount of mRNA that is made to encode this specific protein. And then you have the amount of protein. If you will take a red syndrome neuron in which you knock down MACP2, uh, what you will have is very little mRNA and you will have almost no protein. Well, depending, if you can knock it down completely or you will get nothing, if you actually have a partial uh, uh, deficit of the, of the MECP2 or mutation, which is not fully functional, you might get a little bit of mRNA, a little bit of the protein, 
and you also have a smaller neurons. So in the red syndrome, for some reason, they, 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 they have a smaller neurons, the networks that you, may, that you see in red, so whether animal models or, um, or humans. But, um, so the hypothesis and the data that I'm gonna present here today is uh, uh, to test that MECP2 mutations in excitatory neurons, those that produce uh, excitation in the nervous system, will result in an outer network development and function during red syndrome. So, and this can be identified by manipulating MECP2 expression in human-induced pluripotent stem cells uh, derived neurons. So we can use this model system, theoretically take a biopsy of the skin of a human, uh, and then actually do what I was telling you, produce induced, uh, induced uh, pluripotent stem cells, and then from the induced pluripotent stem cells to make neurons, and from those neurons, we can make neural networks. And now we can see how these neurons are wiring in a network, right? So uh, the experimental paradigms that uh, my collaborator at, at Sick Kids, uh, James Ellis, has used uh, as a standard is basically to take um, um, uh, skin biopsies for, from unaffected individuals. For example, this individual, we call it PGP C14, and this one, uh, uh, we're uh, three, and these unaffected individuals, you can take biopsies. You can actually, what we call it wild type iPSCs, we can obtain iPSCs from these fibroblasts. Remember, these individuals are unaffected. Now, the critical thing that you can do here by using CRISPR Cas technology, you can actually knock out the, the MECP2 gene, and you can have knockout neurons or knockout, I'm sorry, um, um, iPSC cells from uh, uh, these individuals. Right? And the first thing that these experiments they show is what knocking out or, or removing MECP2 from the development of this early network formation in the nervous system does. Now, when, when, when uh, uh, in this particular individual, when they did this, um, they find uh, there was a deficit in the MECP2. These bars are kind of easy to read. This is uh, some kind of Western blot that we have in there, uh, which is a way to read how much proteins you have in the cells. And what you see here in something that's called a D3 nu, that you have a, 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 a white space here and a white space here in the work. So it's for individuals or for cells that where MECP2 has been actually uh, a knockout for knockout IPSCs from MECP2. This is the concentration of MECP2, and this is some kind of control protein to show that this is not an artifact. And you can see that they can actually did, did knock out the production of this protein in that uh, specific uh, uh, model system. So now when uh, they examine whether the wild type, is, I mean, the wild type are the ones without the knockout, and the WIRP are the ones with the knockout, and the same thing, for uh, PGPC14. So you can find that the cells from this null, which is where you remove the MECP2, they're smaller than the cells. Those are neurons made from, from, the, from this uh, induced uh, uh, pluripotent stem cells, that this neuron seems to be smaller than the comparison here. Uh, what we call isogenic control, because come from the same cell line, but it doesn't have the knockout. Um, uh, and you see that the neurons are smaller. So what are the consequences of having these smaller neurons in a network? So it uh, doesn't matter at all. So to do that, there were two different procedures that we did to test the function of these neurons. Uh, one was uh, to do patch clamps, which is basically you take an electrode and you go into a neuron and then you actually pop the neuron and then you start stimulating the neuron with current and you measure how the neuron reacts the same way that you're measuring current in the transistors. And the other one is to put a network of neurons on a plate that has a lot of electrodes underneath. And then you can measure the activity of these neurons in the network. How do they are talking to each other? So after that, you can actually uh, acquire this data, which is what we do. We take the data and we do a, a analysis of this data to look at how the network formation is happening in the knockout and in the control. And then uh, we uh, can produce biophysical models and we can look into biological mechanisms. And then uh, we can also look into possible interventions. Let me just give you a little bit of details of what we have done in this project. So let's just say that we have two types of recordings. Once we got the, the IPSC cells and we induced them into neurons, that there is a specific protocol to do that. 
um, uh, you can actually put an electrode in, in a neuron, in micropiper in this case, to do it the patch client, you can do what is called an intracellular recording. And through this electrode, you can actually in, induce, uh, inject current into a neuron. In this case, for example, these are positive current, and this is a negative current. When you inject a positive current, you see the neuron firing action potentials. So neurons get activated. And we can measure how many action potentials the neuron fire, uh, uh, how excitable, they, how much current do I have to pass into the neuron to do, uh, to do that. And you can also uh, um, uh, do several other manipulations that I'm not gonna talk about here. And you have the extracellular recording, which is remember the plate where you put the neurons on top and the electrodes actually uh, are measuring the spontaneous activity of these neurons in the plate. How the neurons are talking to each other spontaneously. It's when you have the invigilator, you take it out of the room and you let the room to talk to each other as what happens in the room that is, is development at its own pace. That's pretty much what the extracellular recording is. And uh, so this type of recordings gives you two different types of signals that we can analyze in the lab and we can track conclusions about what is happened functionally, what the, the, the absence of MECP2 can do to a function of a cell. And here are two examples of what we call it a wild type that doesn't have the mutation. And what you see here is uh, basically voltage. And here different current pulses with different colors that they are, the current injection is here with the amount of current that we pass increasing as we go in this axis. And these currents were for, for about one second uh, stimulation. Uh, and then what you see is that in the wild type, we inject the currents and the cell is responding with a lot of action potentials, but in the MECP2 mutant, they respond a little bit here at the beginning and then kind of stop responding. It's almost like if the cell run out of juice to respond to the stimulation. And you can look at into this uh, uh, specific um, diagram in which we're plotting the current passed by, uh, uh, um, by the micropipette, through the micropipette and the firing rate of the neuron. And you see that the red syndrome, they start very quickly to react. But then it run out of gas and it goes and it gets asymptotic here. So it can't produce more action potential. It's almost like it has the capacity to, to produce more activation. Uh, it saturates very early. While the wild type, it starts a little bit uh, late, but it goes on and on and on and on and it saturates at a much larger current. So this cell could be characterized as a cell that is more excitable. And um, because have a lower threshold for excitation, the red syndrome cell. But if you look at the wild type cell, it's a cell that is, uh, uh, has higher threshold, but it produces much more action potential. So it can go for, long, for longer. This is an engine that actually could work in a, in a, in a, in a stronger or in a longer or larger dynamic range. So this is one of the, of the findings that we have in this uh, specific case. Now you can take those cells and you can look at, that was for only one cell at the time. This was uh, done in the lab of Michael Salter at SickKids. So he basically, um, um, one ball, so the, 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 the postdoc that did this, he was patching cells and did one at the time. And for doing that, you block synaptic transmission. You make sure that while you're passing signals into the cell, you don't have signals from the other cells talking to that cell. So, but we can also look at when these cells proliferate actually, and they become a full network in a play, and these cells start wiring. I mean, you can see actually under the microscope how these cells are wiring to each other and how they are becoming, uh, um, uh, they are acquiring this neuropil, the, 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 the dendrites and axons that you see in that um, cell. So now what you can do is to put it in a play, you put all these cells in a play where you have a matrix of electrodes, and now you can actually quantify the amount of uh, um, uh, the different action potentials in, in, in different electrodes, which are fired by the cell. And you will see this plot again and again. You see these little lines that go on and on and on. Each one of them is, is, is an action potential. And it's the code that cells use to communicate with each other. So you send a train of action potential. This may mean that there is a, what we call it a burst here, which is a lot of action potential. There is a lot of happening. And then maybe something doesn't happen for a long time and then goes again and again. Um, this is a simplified explanation what I'm giving you of the neural code. There is much more to it, but uh, you can take my work here in a, um, uh, for that specific uh, model. 
So, and if you do that in a real system, uh, you can get something like this. So as you can see here, this is actually the, the voltage for each channel. And what you see here is a visualization of how the cells are, you see the cells are going on at the same time, on and off at the same time. And if you look at here, lower uh, in this lower panel, you can see what we call bursts of action potential. The cells fired a lot of action potentials and they go stop. And they fire a lot of action potentials and they stop. And this is one of the things that got made into this field because it's, it's just an amazing thing that you can see those cells that are trying to talk to each other. It's like they're shouting very loud and then they rest and they shout very loud again and then they rest. And what this shouting means that they're firing trains of action potentials that are trying to wire the whole network. And what may happen in these networks is that they try to wire everything with everything. And if you have a, a probably look into the literature in our development, there is a lot of pruning of connections after during the development, right? In this early network stage, it seems to be that these networks are trying really very strongly to wire the whole network. And then, uh, uh, and they do it through this process that is called bursting of action potential that probably trigger a, a, a machinery at the level of the synapse to, to strengthen the, the, the connectivity between two cells. And the MECP2 plays a critical role in this machinery. All right, so this is done with a system that is called Axiom, which is basically the plate, and this is just a visualization. I hope that this is clear uh, for many of you. When we record that um, uh, in different uh, cultures, and you look at the function of the week, for example, in week, in week one, each one of these points is an action potential or a signal that the cell is producing, and it looks kind of disorganized, but if you look at week two, there are more of them, and there are more cells coming into the culture probably, and you can see some sort of uh, cluster of action potentials here. I should say this is time, recording time in seconds, and this is the channels. There is no particular configuration of these channels. These channels are arrayed in a matrix, but here we're showing it in, in, in some kind of a role for you to, uh, to look at it. And if you look at week three, then you see very defined patterns of bursting. So the cells are going up and they go silent, they go and they go silent. And this is a process that is essential for the wiring of these early networks. Actually, by the way, something similar you could see in the EEG, in the, in the neonatal, in neonatal EEG, especially in premature uh, children. Um, and this is what is happening, is our interpretation. There is very few connections here between cells. There is a little bit more here, and here the cell is really getting connected. The network is getting connected. And that's what the brain is a lot about connectivity, right? Connectivity that allow me, my vision, tell my hand to move and to grab the, the, the uh, um, a cup of tea or something like that. So connectivity is very essential in the brain. So the bursts are trained of, of, of spikes fired in rapid succession, followed by these periods of quiescence that can uh, connect neurons by triggering synaptic plasticity. Now, what happened, interesting thing, what happened when you remove MACP2 of the equation in these developing neurons. What happened is that in the wild type, you have these very nice birds that are very nicely organized. And when you look at the red syndrome, you have fewer birds, but you also see that the birds kind of last a little bit longer. So in these MECP2 mutant neurons or, or red syndrome neurons, um, what we have is that the birds are not happening as fast and there are not as many action potential signal per burst. So this is very, very notoriously uh, seen in these networks. Um, the way that we quantify that is we look at the burst bursting frequency. So how much was the frequency that, that the neurons were firing burst? And what you see here in the wild type here on the left, and you see the MECP2 mutant here on the right, and you see that the peak bursting frequency in the mutant was much lower than in the red syndrome. And uh, you can see that uh, as a function of the week at the beginning, they start at zero. Zero means that they have about the same number of births, the mutant and, and the wild type. But then the, the mutant start going down, 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 and decrease the actual the birth frequency. Same thing happened with the other mutation, the PGPC14. Uh, so again, on the left, you have the isogenic control. And on the right, you have actually the, uh, the mutant um, um, uh, null for MECP2. I should say that 
the fact that this has an isogenic control that is coming from the same cell line is kind of important because there is a lot of variability in these recordings. So uh, this is a very important control in this field of research. Now we did something pretty interesting, which is actually try to plot that in a color form to, to kind of come up with some sort of a message. And um, the MACP2 mutant neurons have lower excitation threshold, far fewer spikes, and at that facet that the wild type neuron. What you see here in this uh, uh, color uh, diagram is the time. This is for the intracellular recording, for the patch clamp recording, because we have tried to put the two results from the intracellular and the network recordings together. And what you see is that as you increase current intensity, which is in the, here in this uh, going uh, up in the, in the y-axis here, so the cells actually, they fire more action potentials, which is the firing radius in this color scale. When means here more yellow, means that the cell is firing much more action potentials as you increase the, uh, that. And the action potential, they, the rate of action potential or the intensity of the activation kind of decreases over time, right? But in the red syndrome, you don't have the higher activation when you have the higher currents. Actually, the red syndrome has here an intermediate currents. The MECP2 mutant and red syndrome I'm referring to uh, uh, in the same way. And what you see is that they really run out of juice very quickly, which is all this black thing here means that they stop firing, they stop signaling. So this is in vitro. So this is when we stimulate one neuron at the time and we block all the synaptic transmission. Now, what they do in the network is a little bit different. What we do, do in the network, you see that the pattern here kind of has inverted. So in the network, what happens to the wild type neuron is that they fire a few action potentials with a high rate here at the beginning. Uh, this is actually in, in weeks. So this is a different scales as in here, it's in weeks. Just, uh, um, but the most important thing here, this is concentrated here at the beginning, and then uh, they stop firing. But remember, this is stop firing is not because the stimulation is stopped. This is stop firing is something that the network seems auto-regulated. I fire a lot, and then I do a side. I fire a lot and do side. The red syndrome doesn't do that. The red syndrome seems to be like uh, the network is compensating and it's trying to fire more, to fire more, and to extinguish the firing much later over time. So. In a nutshell, what we think that is happening here is that when you put the neurons in a network, they're trying to overcompensate. Because now let's, we are together, let's try to find a solution to this problem. Let's try to fire longer bursts. But when you file longer bursts, you also have consequences. And maybe they drive the network to exhaustion at the end and, and the network may collapse or the function may be impaired. Now, um, we collaborated with uh, uh, Lyle Muller's lab to, to, to model this, this kind of process, and I'm going to try to go quickly here. Basically, you can build a, neuro, a network model, a computational network model of this red syndrome uh, 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 wild type networks. And what you can do is to assign an equation to each one of these nodes of the neurons. And this equation is going to have a different parameters that they're listed here. So, and each parameter has a biological correlate. So it's very similar to when talking in closely words, simulating the action potentials, we use the same equation uh, uh, to do that. But you can simulate this different type of, of, of uh, current that has a biological correlate, for example, a channel or a conductant or, or different things. And when you do that, you can simulate the IPSC network. Uh, uh, you can run a simulation uh, uh, where you can simulate this, this burst firing in the IPSC network. And you can produce also a power spectral density, which is telling you what is the oscillation frequency of the network, what is actually the burst frequency of the network. And, and to make the long story short, this first component here, uh, the other one might be harmonics, but this first component here in frequency is the main frequency at which the bursts are actually produced in the network. These are the channels, which is, uh, if you look at the red line, this peak here aligned to this specific frequency in this axis is giving you the main frequency of the network. Now, uh, when we simulate the red syndrome network or the, or the, the knockout uh, network, what you see is that this peak occurs much uh, to the left and more, much slower frequencies. So basically, and, and this was done by, uh, by using uh, a change in something called the adaptation current, which is an intrinsic property of the neurons. It's a current that the neurons express in the membrane or a channel that the neuron express in the membrane and allows the neuron to uh, to produce certain uh, parameter that is called adaptation to adapt. 
So by changing this adaptation current, we have an idea that MECP2 might be doing something very uh, uh, primal to this uh, intrinsic current. So but what about patients with MECP2 mutation? I'm going to tell you shortly the story um, that we have been working lately. Um, we actually had the, the possibility to find a patient with a very, uh, with a, what you call a missense mutation, which is a point mutation of the MECP2 gene. And in this case, the mutation, uh, what it does is a cytosine by an uh, adenine. So it's replacing the adenine by cytosine in this uh, chain. And it causes actually that the, the protein has a leucine here, which is an amino acid, and it's going to be replaced by a tryptophan. Uh, the tryptophan amino acid is a little bit, uh, they're both large amino acids, they're very similar. So the, the, the mutation is just the single thing. And it seems to be that it does produce symptomatology, but this patient was specifically diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. And then after they isolated this mutation, they diagnosed the patient with a red syndrome, but has a very light, uh, 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 mild form of, of, of the red syndrome. So the prediction here is that probably this point mutation won't affect things as much as you will see with the stronger phenotypes in red syndrome. Um, indeed, this patient was called CLT, and you see that the CLT patient here, uh, you see this band with the null, this is the same day that I showed with the null, we have a deletion of the MECP2, but with this patient we have actually uh, that there is presence of MECP2 gene. So the mutation is not enough to shut down the production of MECP2. So you still have a protein that has certain degree of function. And when you look at neurons, the, the neurons between the, the, the wild type CLT and the and the and, and the and the mutant were actually uh, 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 not that uh, different. So I should say that this wild type we can obtain it by correcting the mutation. The mutation can be corrected, and then you can find the wild type protein. That's uh, something that you can do. Now, when you look at the patient, uh, to make the long story short, for the single neural recordings, they look very similar, the CLT124W uh, uh, and the wild type. And when you look at this data over here, actually, you see that uh, in the green and the, and the orange, that were the mutated knockout uh, MECP2, the, the, the frequency was much lower. In this patient, the frequency actually goes a little bit higher. And this is in this, um, you can see in this diagram where this actually uh, um, brown, reddish uh, 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 dots, they're above the zero line, which means that they're even a little faster. And we found very interesting because if you look at the two uh, mutant, uh, these are basically the main frequencies of oscillations of the network in the two uh, mutants here and here in the CLT wild type. Those are wild types and they look very similar. But when you look at the, the mutants, they are much slower here in the lower row, here and here. And when you look at the CLT, it goes even a little faster. What's, what is happening to this protein in this patient is that trying to go faster. The networks are trying to work faster than we usually work. And this is something that has also been implicated in the pathology of autism spectrum disorders. Um, um, and we're doing some work in another uh, uh, gene called shank 2 for another protein. Um, basically, as a conclusion, the IPC derived single neurons and neural networks, um, they produce a, a loss of function that shows structural and functional changes relative to isogenic control. So um, the same model, uh, the new uh, MECP2 mutation show higher excitability, but a decrease in the number of action potential. Some neurons that are very jumpy, very excitable, but they run out of juice as you increase the stimulation current. So they can keep up probably with the regime on the network, um, uh, which explained probably the decrease in burst frequency and connectivity in the network. And also the data from a patient with a single point mutation and normal expression show a milder phenotype. Also the patient still has symptomatology. It hasn't showed the, the normal course of a red syndrome with, with deterioration or that many of the red syndrome patients have with strong mutations that produce loss of function of the MECP2 gene. Actually, this patient has a milder form of red syndrome. I want to end up by um, saying something that I, uh, I would like to convey this message. Uh, I think that we're witnessing a revolution in biomedical research uh, due to the confluence of four different technologies. One is the human genome sequences technologies. Now you can sequence your patients and you can find mutations 
in many patients, so it has become more accessible. The other one, the cell reprogramming technology. So you can take actually differentiated cells and you can convert it into pluripotent stem cells. And, and then from those stem cells, you can actually go in this landscape of cell types and convert it into different types. And this goes also for heart cells, for liver cells, for, for many other things. The other thing is the tissue engineering technology for in vitro systems. So you can take those cells now and you can engineer uh, in an in vitro system and you can even make an organoid that allows you actually to simulate the features of the organ in, in the organism. And that one is the genome edit editing technology. The genome editing technologies allows you to repair changes in the DNA and to find interventions that may be able to cope with, uh, uh, with may be able, may allow personalized medicine. And I think that the hope is that we can actually um, find a way to, to, to do individual patients. Imagine a point where we can actually extract fibroblasts from these individuals and they're trying to find rescue intervention for many of the deficits that they have, whether it is pharmacology, whether it is uh, genetic uh, interventions. But actually I, I do see, and I strongly believe that this is the future of many of the development, developmental, neurodevelopmental uh, disorders uh, uh, um, research that we're gonna have in the future. I just want to acknowledge Kartik Pradipa, who was just behind all this project. He's a grad student in the lab. Um, Milad Kaki is a postdoc in the lab. And there was also a fantastic collaboration with James Ellis, who is the genius behind the making of all these cells. He's uh, 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 an incredible person to collaborate with at Sick Kids. And also, Lai Mula, my collaborator here at Western, who is a quantitative, very strong uh, uh, scientist, very enthusiastic about all of this. And, um, uh, and thank you very much and all the people in the lab. So I'll stop here. Thank you, Julio. I mean, that was a fantastic talk and really um, very exciting and, and, and very hopeful for what I think has traditionally been seen as a really disabling uh, <coughs> um, condition. It provides real hope in a way that at least to my limited knowledge of retinol hasn't been present in the past. So, so one of the first questions we got uh, relatively early on was from Dr. Goldberg. <clears throat> Excuse me, but was about um, I think people at uh, University of Virginia have been talking about um, uh, gene uh, or genetic treatments for um, using mRNA for uh, for retinol. Do you have any thoughts about that or any knowledge? No, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> I'm not very much knowledgeable about that particular. So I do know about uh, uh, gene therapies for Red syndrome, and I think that those are very. Uh, uh, I would say one of the, of the hopes, because Red syndrome is such an identifiable uh, 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 thing. I mean, clinically, you can find it has, but uh, genetically, you can find actually the mutation. But I would say this, um, there is a lot of hope in gene therapy. You may have to capture very uh, early during, during development in order for you to do that, something like that. Uh, otherwise, there are methods that they need to be de developed to uh, to catch things because the thing with neurodevelopment is that you have these neurodevelopmental periods. And when the periods actually start and the whole structure is formed and something like that, it is hard to reverse. You can reverse the cells, but you cannot reverse the person. So it has to be catched at the very initial stages. But also I do believe that it may offer certain hope for uh, a particular, uh, for example, pharmacology. Pharmacology, you can test pharmacological interventions in which you uh, well, if you can control this burst frequency and the burst frequency is what determines actually the synapse formation, you may actually effectively avoid that the one year old patient deteriorates so rapidly. Um, um, with the genetic therapy, I, I'm not very, it, the problem is that it's controversial, you know, it's very controversial. And these interventions, when you have one casualty, because something happened in the intervention and if you're not very well controlled and the things don't go well enough, uh, the whole field of research suffers, uh, 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 it stops right there. And, and then uh, a lot of advocacy groups, everyone and people with, with, with good reasons, they start trying to stop it. That's what I think that this in vitro system, the, when we control, and we are able to have a good handle on in vitro systems. I think that we can switch to those uh, um, more uh, uh, therapeutical interventions. Um, pharmacology probably is gonna be the first things to do because pharmacology, the drug can always go away, you know, stays for a little bit and it goes. 
I think that's a great point, Julia, because I, I and I don't know the average age of diagnosis of Rett syndrome. Perhaps somebody, uh, one of the developmental pediatricians, can sort of help us out with that. But yeah, I would think that in order to do it, um, any kind of genetic treatment, you'd have to catch it sort of before the um, the problem starts. But wouldn't with with the bursts that you're talking about, wouldn't you want to catch that at the very beginning also? Yes, absolutely. But for example, if uh, that, that's one of the things that the four things that I call the genetic, the, the genome uh, uh, sequencing. If you were able to establish genome sequences for uh, neonatal uh, patients, so even for patients at risk for some, some kind of, uh, uh, you might be able to capture very early because when the red syndrome, they start deteriorating after six months or a year, the pediatricians, I'm not a, a pediatrician, I might not seeing red syndrome in a, in, a, in a practice. So probably some people in the, here, they know more than me. But they do give you a window in which you can actually produce that, and, and that uh, uh, other disorders could be a, a little bit different. But um, by uh, it will give you a window. But uh, so, genome genome sequencing has to be accessible, and we don't have that as a battery now for prenatal screening. We, well, we and, it, and it, the other thing is too, though, that we had like depending upon penetrance and all sorts of things. Like we know that monozygotic twins don't always. Have, I think with schizophrenia, there's not you know it's like a fifty percent concordance or something like that, and so that doesn't. And I, I have no idea. Well, I don't even know if there've been concordant or discordant twins with uh, with red syndrome. But so Daisy Pavery, one of the uh, pediatricians who's joined us today, said that uh, from her experience, it's sort of the age of diagnosis around two to four, uh, and I think unfortunately by then, my guess will be a lot of the deterioration has already happened. Uh, and and I, I think for any parent, right, that when you start seeing your child, I think there's probably going to be some denial initially, uh, potentially, of, of, of what's happening. Uh, and so I think that would be the really hard part is catching people early enough. But when you're talking about the, the birth of things, so does that imply that some kind of, I don't want to use the word anticonvulsant, but something like that might have some kind of um, impact if, if you could do it early enough? I think so. I think that if you can do it early enough, it might have some kind of impact. Depends on the intervention to what I was saying, because the gene therapy is something that uh, still a lot of people find highly controversial. And, and to trigger, because you, you, you're you triggering, I mean, if you use mRNA, it's a little bit different, but if you trigger changes in the DNA, so that thing is going to stay forever and you start doing and the risk for many other things, right? Um, uh, my My... My vision on that is that we have really a good link between the clinical and, and the more basic uh, uh, research in this area, not calling basic, but these tools that we can develop, that we can make it accessible to the clinicians and we can actually start those screenings at early ages. I know that, for example, motor deficits like uh, or, or microcephaly or, I mean, these kind of things, they could start very early uh, uh, in those, and the diagnosis happens at two to four years of age because you know, the parents, they say, no, no, it's just a little delay. This is going to recover. Uh, and But those things, in many cases, in my experience, actually, that is not a lot, but I have some experience on that. They appear very early. And sometimes you talk to pediatricians and they tell you, no, 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 let it go. And we'll see you in two or three months. And go. But these tools, if we were able to develop tools that could do this genetic testing, at big scales, I think that they could actually reveal a lot of things before they happen. Because many of these genetic programs that start getting implemented later, or well, the system compensates to a point, like these networks were trying to compensate, trying to fire more spikes, but then they run out of juice and they start deteriorating because cells start dying or they start just losing connections or pruning things that they shouldn't be pruned or not pruning things that they should be pruned because pruning may be another developmental program too. So um, I, I think that's my vision on this. We really have to bring the clinic, the bench side to the bedside in this specific case is very important. Well, and what's really nice about Red Center is that the gene that causes it is known uh, and so it provides that opportunity. Uh, and so, and, and you know, Nicole Neal, who is um, in the Faculty of Education and runs the Applied Behavioral Analysis Program, she does research uh, on a sort of early intervention with Down syndrome, and she talks about it being a perfect model for early intervention because typically parents are aware before the child is born that the kid has uh, uh, the child will have Down syndrome, and so you could theoretically start at the moment of birth. And, and if the sort of uh, test that you're talking about, if you could get it early enough, then you'd be able to do that. I guess though that you know if if MECP2 is a gene that regulates other genes, I just wonder about what the impact of trying to manipulate that is going to be in terms of other genes and what they do. Yeah, well, it is a it is a transcriptional regulator. It's really uh, it regulates the, the mRNA expression. That's most of the. But you're right. I, I, 
trying to trying to restore functionality is one thing, right? Uh, because if you try to restore functionality, you have to trust that the rest of the machinery is actually working, which is a complicated, another complicated issue. But uh, for these cases, like the ones that I show with single point mutations and things like that, very specific, I, I think that pharmacological intervention, again, could be a, an option. And when you have, um, I mean, the first thing that you have to do is to recognize, to recognize the problem. And my vision on this kind of field of research is that if you start with things like you just said it, Rob, that they're very easily identifiable. The, the Down syndrome, we have it there. The Red syndrome, we have it there in, in many cases. Uh, other, in autism spectrum disorder, I mean, it's just like a, a jungle of things that you can find there. So it's not very easy. But for example, microcephaly, uh, there are very genes that determine uh, cerebral folding and, and proliferation of neurons in those uh, initial stages. Those have been the target. Many people are targeting those diseases now. Uh, I know that they're trying to target these very identifiable problems that you can pinpoint and then to go into that. Then in the future, we may be able to do more uh, with, with more complex uh, genetics uh, disorders. Well, and I don't want to uh, dominate the, but I guess the other issue is that the assumption then when you talk about the earlier intervention with, with um, addressing the birth is the assumption that when the clinical features begin is when the problems start. But I mean, for all we know, the problems begin in, in neonatally with Rett syndrome, and, but they just don't happen to manifest themselves until later on. Yeah, this is exactly what would the point, the point that we want to make here, that we see those changes as neurons start. The moment that you have 100 or 500 neurons in a dish, that's where you start seeing the changes happen. So it started very early. And what we saw is that what we think is that because the, the, the age of the culture or, or, or it's not the same as the age of the patient, right? So there is a, a, a different, uh, but what we see is that they happens really early. As soon as the neurons start wiring this, this, and probably what happens during this first year of life is that you can compensate because, you know, when you put all the cells together and they're pulling and, 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 and trying to, uh, they may be able to compensate and, and drive normal development. And then they, they put, they, they, after that, they just run out of juice or what I was saying and they cannot compensate anymore. Also because the demands, there are different demands when you have them one year old, I mean, you start language. There is a lot of things that start happening at this point. And those developmental program, programs may be too much for these uh, networks to cope with that. Maybe that's, that's our interpretation. Absolutely. So, I mean, other uh, thoughts or comments, especially from uh, people who might see kids with, with Rett syndrome clinically more than certainly than, than I or, uh, or Julio does, are there any other questions or comments for Julio uh, about what is almost certainly truly cutting edge research? Okay, well, I think, you know, Julio, this was a phenomenal talk and it really uh, raises uh, more questions than it answers uh, in, in some ways, but I think that's what science is about, right? We answer one question and that raises more. Uh, and I think it'll be really interesting to check in with you in a couple of years and see where this has gone and sort of what has, uh, has changed because it is, as I say, very, very exciting. And in a field that I say with Retson on my understanding is it's, it's exploded in terms of our knowledge in the last few years, which is phenomenal and really exciting. So thank you very much, uh, if I can. So everybody, when, uh, when, when we log off, you should see a, uh, um, a link for the uh, evaluation. Please complete them, but also when Sarah sends your uh, certificate of attendance for uh, professional credits, you will see it there also. And please, uh, if you could fill them out, that'd be really helpful for us. So our next presentation is uh, by the uh, esteemed Dr. Uh, Jennifer McLean on February 9th at 4 um, p.m. Uh, and then just the other thing is uh, on March the 30th, we have our annual spring continuing professional development uh, afternoon. And uh, we will be hearing people talk about sort of legal issues in developmental disabilities with regards to consent and, uh, and capacity. Um, and also um, somebody again talking about um, uh, dental issues, uh, Dr. Olaf Plotsky, who's with the cleft lip and palate uh, and craniofacial anomaly team uh, is gonna join us. And then somebody, uh, people from community services coordination network or CSCN around accessing services as people get older. Uh, so, uh, and uh, Sarah sent an email around everybody. Registration will be available soon. 
it is online, there's no limit, and there is no cost. So uh, we hope everybody can join us uh, there. And uh, and thank you um, again, Julio. This was uh, fantastic. I really appreciate it. Thank okay. you very much. Thanks, okay. everyone. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.